So good evening, everyone. And uh, today we are going to talk about those essential topics which are absolutely important for your PMP exam. Because this is a revision session, so we will not go into the details of it. Uh, but we will definitely touch base. We'll use examples. We'll understand all those topics well. These are the topics which are found to be commonly confusing to all uh, the participants that I have discussed. Not to everybody, but to majorly uh, most of the people who talk uh, to me about the concerns, they talk about these terms. Okay, So those are the terms that I have uh, collated together. And we will be discussing about uh, all those topics in this session. These are the topics that we are going to see. Just a second. Yeah. Looks like a lot of topic to be covered in uh, 60 to 90 minutes, but uh, let us go through it one by one. My suggestion would be that whenever you see a technique or a term being discussed, and if you have not understood it, okay, please stop me. Let us discuss that and then only we move forward. Okay, You have to understand it absolutely well, only then we should move ahead. Otherwise, as I said, these are commonly confusing terms and very commonly used in exam. Right? So you should not get confused with any of these topics. So stop me, I'll discuss those, and then we'll move ahead. All right? So let us start with the first one. Data gathering techniques. So throughout the project, okay, you would be gathering a lot of data. Data for requirements, data for scope, data for, uh, let's say you're discussing about stakeholders, identifying the stakeholders. Many, many times, Many, many times you will see that you are gathering a lot of data in the project. What we need to understand is that we can use any of these data gathering techniques. Like there are multiple data gathering techniques. We can use any one or we can use many of them in our project. So what are those techniques? First, benchmarking. Okay, If you want some, some certain data, what you can do is you can benchmark a product, a competitor's product or a previous project. Right? You can benchmark something, use it as a reference, and then take data, whichever is relevant for you in the project. The second technique is document analysis. See, the term itself suggests that you are analyzing a document. It could be organization policy that you are analyzing. It could be industry standards that you are analyzing. It could be a previous project that you are analyzing. Right? But you are analyzing means you're just reviewing the document. You are looking at the document, understanding the document, and again, taking out data, which would be important for you in the project. That is called document analysis. Nothing high fire around it. Then we have checklist. See, whenever you are gathering data, you will be talking to people, you will be using documents, you'll be doing a lot of things. Most of the cases, what would happen is you need to be sure that you have discussed all the points that you have to discuss. Right? How would you come to know? See, there could be three to five people, 10 people, 12 people in the project gathering data about scope, about stakeholder, about many other things. How would they know what all things are to be checked? How would they know what are questions are to be asked? Okay, Checklist provides a great opportunity to ensure that uniformly everybody is asking the same question to the stakeholders to whomever they are discussing. Right? So checklist help you in uniformly identifying the points. Right? The checklist will have five, six points, 10 points that you have to check. You pick it up or somebody else picks it up. Okay, somebody leaves, somebody, someone else joins the uh, project. They will always be answering and asking the same points that are mentioned in checklist. So it makes the data gathering uniform. Then discussing with people, brainstorming is discussing with random 10, 15, 20 set of people and asking, asking about points. Right? Gathering the raw form of data is what happens through brainstorming. Right? Sometimes what may happen is that, yes, you have had a general set of people from multiple different backgrounds and then you have discussed. Sometimes you may need to discuss with some specific experts only, like finance experts, legal experts, marketing experts. And you want to discuss with just a close group. That is called focus group. And you are focused on one particular topic and then you are discussing among the team members. So 15 to 20 members, it could be brainstorming. Five to six members, it could be just focus group. 
Now, what happens is in these meetings, there could be people who are not very extrovert, which means who are not very talkative. They don't talk a lot, but they must have some opinion. They must have some knowledge. So you would want to gather data from them also. For that, you do one-to-one -one discussion, right? Which is called interviews. You uh, bring that person, go to the uh, person, talk to them and discuss whatever you want to discuss. This will also help you gather data. That is called interviews. Now, I mean, 15 to 20 is fine. What about 100 people? What about 200 people? What about 5,000 people? If you want to discuss with them, right? what you do is you conduct surveys and questions. You release a set of 15 questions, 15 uh, points to all these 2,000, 3,000 members and gather data from them. Why would you want that? See, when your product that you're going to release into the market is to be used by multiple different users, you would want to capture users' feedback as well, users' requirement as well. This, uh, these surveys and questionnaires will help you. Right? So 15 to 20 general people, brainstorming, five to six focused people for focus group, expert in a particular subject, discussing with just one person, one-to-one -one interviews, and discussing with a lot of people, more than hundreds, surveys and questions. So these are the ways in which you gather data. Basically think about your project. Whenever you want to gather data, you will talk to people, you will look at documents, you will look at competitors, you will release some survey. Okay? There's nothing hi-fi around it. It is just that the names are different. Okay, so these are the data gathering techniques that you wanted to discuss. Next topic is estimation technique. Okay, in our project, we would be estimating for cost, we would be estimating for time, and we would be estimating for resources required. Okay, so estimation can be done again through multiple different techniques. Just like data gathering techniques, we can have multiple different techniques used for estimation. Three of those techniques are most common which is what we are going to discuss. The first one is analogs. The name suggests that we are using analogy. Analogy means we are looking for similarities. As you can see through the image also, we are comparing one thing to the other, and then we are trying to estimate. Look at your previous project and see if you have done a similar work before. You would come to know how much time it took and how much money it took not the estimate, but the actual one. In your previous project, when you were doing an activity, how much time that does the team did the team actually take? How much money was actually spent in doing that activity? That will be a great indication of how much time or money it will take at this time as well, because the activities are similar. For painting the wall in previous project, Okay, if you're painting for five floors, it costed you, let's say, for example, $5,000. You're doing a similar work now, five floors. Okay, so in your estimate, you should take $5,000 because last time it took $5,000. This was your actual value in the last project. So in this project, whenever you are estimating, you should take that value okay? because this is what you saw. This is what it was, it was actually taking. Right? Plus minus whatever range that you want to add, that is fine. But this is the number that you should be taking. This is called analogous estimating. When you are comparing like to like things. Now, sometimes what might happen is that you don't have the like to like uh, activity for comparison. How would you estimate? In such cases, what you do is you try to find some parameters. Okay, which could help you in estimating, and that is called parametric estimating. You look again at your previous project, okay, and you see that, okay, I don't have a data for five floors, but I have data for, let's say, one floor. Okay, or I have data for 10 floors. So I can compare. Right? In completing 10 floors, I took last time. $10,000, let's say, for example, or the project team invested $10,000. So now you have to estimate for five floors. What would it be? There are five floors. How did you arrive at it? Divided in by two. Okay. So what you're doing is you're looking at historical information and using a mathematical equation to arrive at the estimate. This is called parametric estimation. 
parametric means you are using parameters that are available from previous uh, project and then you are estimating right this can be done for activity or it can be done for the entire project also let us say for example you have just initiated the project and your management wants to know what would be the estimate okay you can look at the entire previous project if it is similar entire previous project if it is comparable and then you can estimate right so you can do this estimation at activity level and at project level as well okay. the third type of estimation is where you go into the detail you look at your wbs you go to the work package level and individually for every resource not just people but also uh, computers laptops and everything go to the supplier look at every activity and try to estimate at the work package level when you estimate at the work package level you keep on adding all those estimates work package 1 work package 2 3 4 5 add it all together and you will get it for the complete project right so bottom up estimation is for the project level not for the activity alone okay because bottom up means that you are going to the detail breaking it down to the work package level and estimating for the project that is called bottom up estimating now when you have broken it down to the work package level okay you would come to know about the activities required to deliver this work package and you can use parametric or analogous estimating also so at the activity level you will use parametric or analogous or any other type of estimation and add it all up you will get it for work package add all the work package up you will get it for work based on search right so what happens is because you are doing bottom up estimating with so much of detail that the estimate that you will get for the project is expected to be accurate right now it will be accurate but it is time consuming so what you need to know for the exam is when to use which technique and what are the advantages and disadvantages of the techniques right when you are using historical information for sizable exact same apple to apple comparison okay same to same activity comparison same to same project comparison you can use analogous estimate when you are looking at previous reference but it is not same to same comparison there has to be some parameters you are understanding some rate like 10 dollars per kg uh 1000 dollars per meter something of that sort you are understanding some parameters and by using that parameter you are estimating for future project or this project right that would be parametric and bottom up is breaking it down to the lowest level and then estimate right this is quick this is slow more accurate depends on the historical information so depending on how accurate your historical information is your estimate will also be very accurate right so these are the three top most estimation techniques that we should know now the question is what if we don't have the historical information we cannot use analogous we cannot use parametric and we broke down the bottom up to the work package level also there also we said we will be using parametric and analogous but what if we don't have historical information even in traditional approach project we could be doing many work packages many activities which we are doing for the first time how would we estimate for that in such cases what we do is we call all our team members into a meeting relevant team members of course okay and ask them to provide three different estimates right we don't have historical information we are relying on our team's experience and we are saying let us call all the team members the relevant team members and let us have three estimates instead of one okay one of such estimate would be where we imagine that everything in the project will go wrong all the risks identified everything will happen and everything will go wrong right which is called pessimist view a pessimist will always think that everything is going wrong right okay, so you will ask your team members to provide their pessimistic estimate right pessimistic estimate means you will ask your team members to imagine that everything has gone wrong in the project now tell me your estimate right so 
let us say for example they would tell you that this work to be completed will take i think uh, 12 weeks okay. if everything goes wrong then this activity or this work package will take 12 weeks that is their pessimist view everybody will uh, tell you some number you have to take some average and you arrive at 12 weeks right so that is your pessimistic view of your team members right there is one point second you will say imagine everything going right in the project everything going right nothing no mistakes happens no risk happen no issues happen then how much time it will take okay that would be your optimist view optimist is a person who thinks everything will be right in the project okay then you will ask so they will say okay if that's the case then i think it will take only 3 weeks right so team will provide you pessimist view which means everything is going wrong what would be the estimate team is providing you optimist view which means everything going wrong what would be the estimate and then you will also ask them what is your general feeling what is your general understanding okay which is the most likely estimate which is what do you think 50% of the risk would happen 70% of the risk would happen 60% of the risk would happen what does your experience tell you right what is your most likely estimate right they will say it is 8 weeks just for example i am saying right so what you will do when you don't have a swargar information available you will call your team members and you will ask them for three different estimates pessimistic most likely and optimistic you will have three different numbers right so now what you can do if you want to calculate the estimate you will take a normal average right and your average will become 12 plus 8 plus 3 divided by 3 8 plus 3 is 11 plus 12 23 by 3 somewhere around 7 point something something weeks so this becomes your estimate right so you did not have the information but you have experienced people and they have thought about everything going wrong they have thought about everything going right they have also thought about the normal case scenario you have taken an average of it it's a good estimate to have right so this is your estimate through taking average now people would say that the chances the probability that everything will go wrong right is less the probability that everything will go right is less than the most likely probability right chances that you will be able to finish in 8 weeks is much more or closer to 8 weeks is much more than 12 weeks or 3 weeks because in our project we know not everything goes wrong and not everything goes right right so there is a very little chance that something that we are doing everything will go right and everything will go wrong then why are we giving the same weightage whenever we are taking average so what you will have to do is you will have to give more weightage to most likely estimate because the chances that you will be close to most likely is more and the question is how much more okay how much more are we likely to be closer to most likely the answer is through a normal distribution curve okay you take any sort of data that is normally distributed you will find out this is extreme end right this is at the beginning so this this is where it starts beginning and this is at the end you will find that very less data is towards beginning and end and maximum data is towards middle right so when we are talking about maximum data towards the middle what is this percentage this is 67% okay 16% on the left 16% on the right so any data you take you will see that 70% is the most likely view 16% is the pessimist view and another 16% is the optimist view for example these 16 plus 16% are at the extremes take a data of every single person in your city today at 10 1 million 2 million 3 million 4 million however how much ever people are there in your city take that data 
you will see that 70% of them fall in the height of 5 feet 5 to 5 feet 10 inch. Boys, men. Okay. There are only 16% who would be below 5 feet 5. And there are only 16% who would be above 5 feet 10. Very little, little people. Only 16% above 5 feet 10 and only 16% below 5 feet 10. What I'm trying to say is that whatever data that you take in your life, if it is normal, normally distributed, you will see that only 15% will be at one extreme, 15% at another extreme, and 70% will lie at the bottom. Will be, will be average. Take account of any class, any student, any school. Okay, You will see that 16% people achieve top level score. Another 16% are somewhere near failing the score. Majority have average scoring, 50 to 60% somewhere. 16% will be below 40%, 16% will be above 80, 90%. But majority will fall always under this. Right? Hence, we are saying that estimate also would follow the same pattern. 16% chances that we will have everything going wrong. 16% chances that we will have everything going right. Around 67% chance that it will be most likely. Right? So this 67% is actually converted into fraction. And what you do is pessimist plus four times most likely plus optimist view divided by six. Four by six is somewhere close to 67%. Okay, so P by six, O by six, and four M by six. This becomes your formula. Right? Now, when you do this, you get an estimate which is closer to most likely. And you will feel that it is more accurate. Okay, so you don't have to worry about the explanation that I have done it. But if you remember this well, then you'd also know why we use this one and you'll not be confused. Right? So that's the idea. Whenever you don't have historical information available, what you do is you bring your team members together and ask them for three points. Optimist view, tell me your estimate when everything is going right. Pessimist view, tell me your estimate when everything is going wrong. And tell me your estimate, what you think is the most likely estimate. Then you can take a simple average, it will be a triangular estimation, and you can take a weighted average, which will be a beta distribution. Right? So these are the ways in which you can estimate. These are traditional ways. In Agile, we use story points and other things, so we are not discussing that as of now. Right? But these are the most important estimation techniques that you have to use. Remember for the exam three things. If you have historical information and you have a like-to-like -like comparison, you will use analogs. If you have historical information and it is not like to like, but you have some parameters and mathematical equation that you can use, it is parametric. Okay. When you don't have historical information and you're relying on team's experience, then it is three-point estimating. Three-point estimating can be triangular or it can be beta. Right? And whenever the question is asking you, what is the estimation technique which will give you the most accurate estimate, go for bottom up. Right. Now, there are some cost of quality terms that we should definitely know for our exam. Right? One is prevention cost. See, whenever you are identifying a risk, whenever you are trying to take some action so that the problem does not happen, you are trying to prevent the problem. So whenever you are trying to prevent the problem, you will have to incur some cost. You will have to put in some time, put in some cost. That cost is called prevention cost. If you think that your team members will make mistake, then you provide them training. Training will have some cost. That is your prevention cost. Right? If you are sending material from factory to site and you think that it will get damaged, so you improve the packing of the material, that is also a prevention cost. Right? So prevention cost is whatever action you take to prevent the problems from happening, it will incur some cost and that cost is called prevention cost. Appraisal cost, appraisal means checking. So whenever you are doing a quality testing, whenever you're doing a quality check, 
whatever amount is spent, that is called appraisal cost. And then there's a failure cost. When you realize that something has failed already, okay? So if it has failed, then it becomes a failure cost. You will have to correct it. You will have to remove the defects. You will have to take some corrective actions. That is your failure cost, right? So these are the three types of costs that we should know about in terms of cost of quality because they will be discussed in the exam. Then let us talk about risk responses. If you have any doubts, okay, I'm just reminding you, if you have any doubts in whatever we are discussing, please stop me, raise your hands or uh, uh, stop me and let's discuss. Let us not go ahead with doubts in mind. Yeah? Yes, Manu. Uh, yes, Amit. So here I just wanted to um, reconfirm. So prevention costs generally we do at the initiation state uh, stage, right? So that uh, we are preventing or uh, any additional costs that we should be bearing. Planning. Appraisal planning. is during uh, planning. Oh, stage. during planning. Okay. See, at the initial okay. stage, you are only bringing people together and informing that this is the project. Let us start. Okay. And a general idea, I'm, I'm telling you, bringing people together, telling them this is the project. Let us start. So when you are saying that this is the project, let us start. You will talk about scope, some cost, some time, little bit on an overview, right? So you are explaining or summarizing your project in one or two pages, okay? That is your initiation, right? Everything else which is done in detail happens in planning. Okay, this happens in planning. Appraisal cost is during execution and failure is once it's been uh, this is, delivered, uh, right? measurement and control, right? Uh, monitoring and okay. control. Whenever you are testing something, then you use uh, appraisal cost. Failure cost is also during monitoring control. Okay. Right? Amit, I have a doubt. Uh, yes, so failure cost, uh, uh, it can be of issues as well as risk as well. See, it is ultimately issues. Whether it was risk or not, it is ultimately issues. If you have identified the risk and you have already taken an action, which means you have already right. taken some action related to prevention. Right? If it has failed and you had not identified it, then it becomes a failure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Now let us talk about risk responses. Okay. Risk responses are basically when the team is sitting together, they are trying to identify the risk. And once they have identified the risk, they have to take some response. Right? Once you have already identified that something is going wrong, you have to take some response. Whatever response you do. Okay, but you have to take some response. You cannot say that, okay, I have identified the risk. Let us ignore it. Okay, not a good project management, right? So always you will take some response. Right? Now the question is, what kind of responses you will take? Okay, now this is one of the confusing part that many people have reported that this is confusing. So my suggestion would be, take any activity, take any deliverable from your project. Okay, and try to list down all the responses that you will take and then categorize in the category that I'm showing it to you. For example, if I'm sending material from my factory to site, the risk is that it might get damaged, right? I have already identified that it might get damaged. What all things I can do? I can improve the packing. I can train the driver to drive properly. I can uh, buy some insurance. I can decide not to send by road, but by air. I can decide not to send in the uh, monsoon season, maybe some, some other season. I can decide uh, my uh, driver to not drive in the night, only in the morning. And so you can take n number of action for any particular risk. Okay, Every action that I talked about is some kind of response. If you're buying an insurance, you're transferring it. Okay, So let us look, have a look at all these different risk responses. Okay, one is escalate. Right? If you come across a risk which is not within your authority, you cannot do anything about it. You don't have the expertise. Okay, let us say uh, the material is being sent from factory to site, and there's a risk that it might get stolen, it might get robbed. Okay, if that is the risk then it is beyond my authority to protect it. Okay, I can have security guard, maybe one or two, but I would also need police support. 
okay, from the area that it is going to. So I may need to escalate as well. There could be many things which is beyond my authority, beyond the expertise of the team members. For that, I would need to escalate. Escalation is one of the responses. So once you escalate, whatever they say, you incorporate it to your planning. Right? That is one of the responses. Second is avoid. See, if you are sending material from factory to site and you realize that it is a monsoon season, it will be heavily raining and you have to travel through mountains. The chances of landslide is very high. What will you do? You will say, let us not send the material through this route. Let us use a different route if possible. If that route is also not possible, you will say, okay, let us not send by this mode. Let us use a different mode. Let us fly the material to the customer site. It, it will add some cost, definitely, but it will also reduce the risk. And the risk is that entire material might get damaged. And by sending air, you will be spending maybe at some thousand dollars extra. Right? So if that is possible, use that. That is called avoiding. Changing the plan itself. So if you see that a risk is a high probability risk, that there's a definitely a chance that it will happen, then change the plan itself. Don't let that event happen. That is called avoid. Avoiding the risk. Right? You're avoiding the event itself. The material might get damaged by road, I'm not sending by road. Material might get damaged by this route, I'm not sending by this route. Why, why do we take that decision? Because it is a high probability risk for us. And the chances are huge. Why did I use an example of monsoon? Because in monsoon, chances of landslide increases multiple folds. So it becomes a high probability. If you're sending in summer, maybe not. You may not need to avoid that route. But in rainy season, definitely you will have to avoid. Right? So you will avoid. Avoid means changing the plan itself. Next is transfer. Okay. Let us say, for example, you don't have the money to avoid the plan, to change the plan. You don't have money to send the material by air in your project. Very much possible. So what will you do? You will buy some insurance. With insurance, what are you doing? You are transferring your risk to a third party. You will have to pay some premium, okay, which is fine. Maybe premium could be uh, $1,000, let us say, for example. But you are seeing saving $1 million worth product. If at all it gets damaged, then the insurance company will pay you this amount. And so by spending $1,000, you are trying to protect your damaged material. What have you done? You have transferred the risk to the insurance company. Insurance company now has a risk of $1 million. Why would insurance company do that? Because they are taking $1,000 from 1,000 other people. Okay, So they would be taking $10 million. Out of that, they have to pay $1 million. So because of their calculation, they have done this. It is, does not matter. What matters is, what am I doing as a project manager? As a project manager, I am transferring the risk to the insurance company. Okay, so transfer as a risk response means you are transferring your risk to somebody else. Your headache is transferred to somebody else. That is one of the response. Right? Third response. The fourth one is mitigate. See, mitigate as a response is a word that we use very commonly in our day-to-day -day, uh, project life. Right? Everything that we take, any response that we take, we say, okay, we have to mitigate the risk. We have to mitigate the risk. Even if we are avoiding, we say we are mitigating the risk. Even if we are eliminating, we are saying we are mitigating the risk. But that's not the case. Mitigate means reducing the probability that this risk will occur. Okay, That's the idea of mitigation. So when you improve your packing, when you train your team members, when you do extra testing, when you add extra resources, okay, all you are doing is reducing the chance that the risk will happen. You are not eliminating it completely because you cannot. And in project, we cannot eliminate the whole of the risk. How much ever training you provide, how much ever resources you provide, how much ever testing you do, there will be few things here and there that would go wrong. Right? So what you do is, all those actions that you take is to reduce the probability of occurrence. That is called mitigate. And for those low priority tasks, low priority risks, which may or may not happen, even if it happens, it will cost very little. For that, what you say is, okay, let us document the risk, let us identify the risk and keep some money aside. 
without analyzing the risk. Okay, very important, without analyzing the risk. So you're not analyzing the risk, how much money are and other things it will take. All your low priority threats and risks, you keep a list of it and you keep something called contingency reserve for that. Right? Known risk, low priority risk, you keep contingency reserve outside. Saying that if this risk happens, then we will use our money from contingency reserve. For example, while climbing the truck, the driver might get injured. Okay. So you're sending material from factory to site. Your driver, truck driver is climbing the truck. At that point of time, he or she might slip. And if they slip, there will be some impact. Right? The chances that they will slip is less. Even if they slip, the impact will also be less. Maybe $1, $2 here and there. Right? So for those risks, you are not spending time to think what all things we can do. Should we train the driver to climb the truck? Okay. Should you provide them nice shoes? And you don't have the time to think about these low priority risks. So what you say is that if we have identified this risk, let us document it, let us list it down in the register, but the response of which we will not plan. We have kept some money outside, aside, we will use those money. So if this risk happens, if at all the driver slips, then we will use money from the contingency reserve. That's the idea of accept. So there are five risk responses, okay, which we should know of. If the risk is beyond your authority, escalate to somebody else. If it is a high probability risk that this will definitely happen, try to avoid the event itself. Okay, if you think that there is 90% chance, 80% chance that this might, this might happen, why do that? Okay, avoid it. Right? If you cannot avoid, then transfer it. Transfer it to somebody else. Buy an insurance, find, figure out somebody who, who is ready to take that headache for their own advantage or whatever it is, but transfer that. Right? For many, many risks, mostly most of the risks, what you would need to do is, the maximum that you can do is reduce the probability of occurrence. And that will be called mitigate. And those low priority risks, which might or might not happen, even if it happens, okay, there's a very chance, very little chance that it will happen, 5%, 10% chance that it will happen. Even if it happens, it will cause very uh, less impact. Then you accept it. Keep a contingency reserve for those risks. Right? These are your risk responses. Negative risk is called threat. Positive risk is called opportunity. Threat is essential. Opportunity is not. Hence, we are not covering in this revision session. Right? Is it clear, everyone? Any doubt? All the five responses? Yes, I mean. Oh, thank you. Right? Now, when you create budget, now that we have seen contingency reserve, so we must know about this. See, whenever you are creating a budget for the project, okay, you will estimate all the activities, all the work package. So estimate for all your work package will become work cost estimate. And you will take a sign off on this. It will become cost baseline. Right? Over and above your baseline, you would need to keep some contingency reserve for your project. Right? which is for known risk. The risks that you have identified. For that, you will keep some money out. You will say these are low priority. If at all it happens, let us keep some money out. That is your contingency reserve. When you add contingency reserve to cost baseline, it becomes your budget. Which means this is the amount of money that you will get. So your cost baseline is $0.8 million. Let us say, for example, Contingency reserve is $0.2 million, which means $1 million is your project budget. This is what you will get from your sponsor. You means as a project manager, right? Which means contingency reserve is within your authority. You can decide when to use it. Okay, you don't need permission for using it. That is your $1 million as a project budget. Now, this is for known risk. What about unknown risks? What about mistakes that a team will make? the management will keep certain amount outside of $1 million that they are giving to you as a management reserve. 
so that they can support you in the project somewhere around 0.2 million dollars 10% 20% 30% whatever they think depending on the previous project previous experience that they have had they will keep some money out now this money is beyond the budget hence not within the project manager's authority project manager if they need management reserve they would need to take approval from the sponsor or any approving authority right that's the idea management reserve is for unknown risks something that you have not identified but might happen in the project this is your budget build up very important to understand contingency reserve known risk management reserve unknown risk issues mistakes that might happen in the project which your team could not identify so for that the management keeps the money out but the question is why why should the management keep management reserve out because your management is also getting money from somebody they are taking it from bank they are taking it from investors okay so they are also arranging money from somewhere so they need to also ensure that over and above whatever you are asking they are also keeping a some kind of buffer so that if a mistake happens they don't need to go back to the bank and investors and ask for money they can use from the money that they have already decided right that's the idea of budget bill now earned value analysis right one of the most uh, dreaded topic of all people have fear of this topic but don't worry first pmp exams are not asking calculation questions anymore okay second if you understand the logic you will be able to understand this well there are only few two three things that you need to remember now very very important one of the previously successful participant who passed the the exam last week said that there was one calculation question i verified with one more person and they also said that yes they saw one calculation question but that does not mean that you will have to remember a lot of formula the question was on adding the budget up the question was on the supplier's value and understanding that value so very simple uh, adding addition was added but if they have seen that which means there could be one question in your exam also so don't ignore this chapter do it at the last but don't ignore it okay so what is earned value analysis basically understanding your performance in the project are you doing work faster or slower are you spending more in the project or less in the project okay this is exactly what we have to understand through earned value analysis there are three parameters which you should know how do we arrive at those parameters see we have a plan and we will have something actual right every time in the project throughout your project every month every two months every three months you will be checking your performance how will you check your performance you will compare plan to actual okay. whatever you are performing versus whatever you were supposed to perform you will compare that and you will come to know the values for example if i have started the project in january and it will get over in december i will check in feb march april may june july every month i will check my performance let us say we are at june there were 12 floors to be completed in 12 months so in june your plan was to complete six floors right and you said that for all these 12 floors we will be spending 1 million dollar per floor that was your plan so your budget is 12 million dollars okay right? so 12 floors in 12 months every floor will take 12 million dollars right so your plan at the end of june which is 6 months was to complete 6 floors and in completing the 6 floors you should have spent 6 million dollar right 1 million dollar per floor one floor per month so this is your plan that at the end of june i would complete six floors and we will be spending 6 million dollars that was your plan now what will you do at the june end you will look at it look at the actual and see how much actually you have completed 
Let us say, for example, you have completed only five. Right? And in completing that five floors, you have actually spent $7 million. So your plan was to complete six floors. You have completed only five floors. Your plan was that you will spend $6 million. You have spent actually more, $7 million. So what does this mean? You are working slow. Okay, and you're spending more. So with respect to schedule, time also you are not performing well. With respect to money also, you're not performing well. This is very clear from this itself. But how much slow, how much fast, how much more, how much less is what is required through earned value analysis? How would you know about your efficiency? Why do we need to know our efficiency? Because if you know your efficiency through this, then only you will be able to plan for the remaining six months. That if in this six months, we have done only five floors, then probably for the remaining seven floors, I would need 10 months. Right? So you will ask management for extra time. You will ask the customer for extra time. How will you ask for the time? Two months, three months, four months, how will you come to know? through this earned value analysis, right? So don't worry about a lot of things that get covered in our earned value analysis. What is the most important part is to understand the earned value, planned value and actual cost, okay? Earned value is something, think of, think of it like something that you have earned. See, you will earn something only if you have worked for it. Right. So if I have to look at this example and try to understand what is my earned value, I will have to look at my actual work that I have completed. Five floors. Right. And what is the value that I would have earned? Not $7 million because $7 million is something that I have spent. My customer will not pay me on what I have spent. My customer will pay me on what I had planned for. What I had proposed to them. Right. So if I have completed five floors, my plan was to spend $5 million, $1 million per floor. Right. So my earned value becomes $5 million. So what I have earned till now, only $5 million. Because I have completed only five floors. And what have I spent? $7 million. Right. So very clearly, in terms of cost, there is a variance of $2 million. So my cost variance is $2 million. I have earned only $5 million, but I have already spent $7 million, which means there's a difference of $2 million in terms of cost. Right? This becomes your cost variance. Now let us look at the schedule. Now you will say in terms of schedule, I have planned to complete six floors, but I have completed only five floors. So there's a variance of one floor. But if you take one floor, if it is construction project, it is fine. What about mechanical projects? What about software projects? What about chemical projects? Right. Everything would be different. And second thing, you may complete only 6.5 floors, six floors and few other things also. Right. So it will become difficult to calculate in terms of the difference and you will not be able to compare. So what do you do? you convert this also into value. So you say that my plan was to complete six floors. So my planned value becomes $6 million. Right? So this is my planned value, $6 million. Now in completing this six, million, six floors, Okay. I would spend a certain money, but we don't have to worry about that. What we have to worry about is the planned value only. My plan was to complete six floors. My planned value was $6 million. Okay. I know my earned value was $5 million. Okay. So what have I earned? The value worth five, five floors. What was my plan? The value worth six, six floors, okay. which is $6 million. So now if I have to calculate my schedule variance, my plan was to complete five floors. I have completed only six floors. 
And in terms of floors, I should not calculate because I have to calculate for many other projects also. Right? So hence we have converted into values. So planned value for actual work, planned value for planned work, a difference of it is scheduled variance. So for five floors, my value was $5 million. For six floors, my value was $6 million. A difference is five minus six is equal to one minus, minus $1 million. Right? That becomes my scheduled variance. And as you can see, this negative value tells me that we are doing bad. I was planning to spend $5 million, but I've spent $7 million. I was planning to complete six floors, but I've completed only five floors. So this value, negative value, tells me that I'm not doing good in the project. So anything less than zero is not a good value. Anything greater than zero is a good value for schedule variance and cost variance. Yes, Malika, please, go ahead. Uh, Amit, I got a bit confused for uh, planned value. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we just have to subtract uh, planned value with actual? See, uh, here, earned value is your estimate of actual work. Right? So whatever work you have com uh, completed, the estimate is something that you will earn, whatever you had estimated. Right? Planned value is estimate of planned work. Right? What was your plan of the work completion? Six floors. What was that okay. estimate? Right? That is your planned value. What is your actual cost? It is your actual, right? At actual. The actual of actual work. This is pretty simple. Whatever money that we have spent is my actual cost. So what is the actual work that I have completed? Five floors, right? So what was my estimate for five floors? $5 million. Planned value, what was my planned work? Six floors. What was my estimate for this planned work? Six floors, $6 million, right? Actual cost, what is the actual work that I have done and what is actually I have spent? So in five floors, what is it that I've actually spent? $7 million for five floors. So these are the values that you have to subtract and check. Right? Now, how do we remember which is to be subtracted? See, earned value and planned value are both estimate, which means we cannot compare cost for that. Both are estimate, so you cannot compare cost. You are comparing actual work to planned work. Hence, this is for schedule. Here, if you look at earned value and actual cost, you are comparing actual value to estimate value. What is it that you have actually spent? What was your estimate for the work that you have completed? Hence, earned value plus actual cost is for your cost variance. Is it clear now? Uh, yes, um, to some extent. All right. So let us have a look at the formula also. Right. Cost variance is your earned value minus actual cost. Earned value is your planned value of actual work. Actual cost is your actual value. So your planned value minus actual value is what you are doing at a given point of time. Cost variance is earned value minus planned value. Earned value is your planned work, right? actual work that you have completed. Planned value is your planned work. So you are subtracting actual work minus planned work. That is why it is called schedule variance. Right? Now, cost performance index and schedule performance index are nothing but instead of subtraction, it is division between these two values. Okay. Now, for your exam, all you need to know is that if the cost variance is greater than zero, which means I'm earning more than I'm spending, which means I'm doing a good job. Right? If my schedule variance is greater than zero, which means my actual work is more than the planned work, which means I'm doing a good job in the project. If my cost performance index is greater than one, it means my planned value is more than what I'm actually spending. So I'm spending less. I'm doing good work in the project. If my schedule performance index is greater than one, which is my actual work is more than the planned work, which means I'm doing good in the project, right? So cost variance and schedule variance should be greater than zero because it is subtraction. Cost performance index and schedule performance index should be 
greater than one because it is divisive. If you remember this, you will be able to answer all the questions in the next. Now the next part is schedule analysis. We have done cost analysis. Now let us see schedule analysis. Now, in terms of schedule analysis, there is one part which is very important is to optimize the number of resources. See, every month, sometimes you'll be doing 10, 10 activities, sometimes you'll do 20 activities, sometimes you'll be doing 30 activities. So your activities and your effort will vary regularly throughout the project. But you cannot hire and fire your resources also throughout the project. So what you do is you shift your activities here and there, balance it out so that you can optimize the number of resources. For example, if you need, let's say, for example, January, February, March, April, and May. If you need, let's say, five resources in January, 20 resources in February, 15 in March, 25 in April, and in May also again, five resources. You will not be hiring 15 here and then firing five, then again hiring 10 and then firing 20. You cannot do this right? because it is very difficult to manage those team members. So what do you do? You shift your activities, some of the activities that you have to do in February to March, some of the activities that you have to do in April to May, okay. so that similar number of resources are used throughout the project. So what you will do, you will start with five, then you will hire 10 more, and you will say 15 in Feb, 15 in March, 15 in April, and then again five. So what are you doing? You are trying to optimize the number of resources. That every month we will use same number of resources, at least similar number of resources throughout the process so that we don't have to do hiring and firing every month through my project. So for that, you will shift your activities to next month. What could happen? This could get shifted to June. Right? Naturally, you're shifting February to March, March to April, April to May. So May activities will shift to June. So you will take a little bit more time to complete. If your customer is okay with that, if your management is okay with that, then you have optimized your resource and it is called leveling. You have leveled your resource at the same number. But what if your customer does not agree? They said, no, we cannot postpone to June. You have to complete in May. What will you do? You will add some more resource and you'll say, okay, instead of 15, let us have 17 people every month and we'll still be able to complete in May. Okay. So whenever you are optimizing the resources, okay, you can do leveling, but leveling will extend the schedule. If the extension of a schedule is okay with the customer, sometimes they are, right? Because adding resources will add cost. So either they should give you cost or they should give you time. So if, you, if, you, if they are not okay with giving money, they will give you some time. Or they will say, okay, time is not, uh, not possible to extend. I'll give you some money, add some more resources. This is called smoothing. Right? So leveling will extend the timeline. Customer will not be happy. So you have to smoothen things out. You will add some more resources and it is called resource smoothing. This is called resource leveling. This is called resource smoothing. Right? Objective. Objective is to use same number of resources throughout the project. You optimize the use of the resources. Right? That is called resource optimization. Resource leveling means lengthening the schedule to adjust for the limited number of resources that you are available with. You. So you have limited number of resources, you are using limited number of resources, and you are saying, okay, let us lengthen the schedule a bit. If the customer is not okay with that, what you will do is resource smoothing, adding extra resources so that you can complete the time activities without delaying it. Objective, resource optimization. Next is schedule compression. What is the objective here? To compress the schedule. This is very, very important part. See, the objective should be very clear. Here you are trying to use the same number of resources throughout the project. Here you are trying to compress the schedule, which means you are trying to do activities faster. You are trying to complete the project faster. That is called schedule compression. Objective is to complete the project faster. Here, at the same time, you're not doing faster. You're just not delaying it. You're do 
doing it as per the plan. Here, you are trying to do the activities faster. Why would you do that? Sometimes your management does not agree with the plan that you have proposed. So they will ask you to compress the schedule. Or sometimes you have already made a mistake in the last six months. So in the next six months, you will have to compress the schedule. You have to do things faster. Right? There are two ways in which you can do it. Activities are in sequence. Right? Try to see if you can do this in parallel. Can you start this activity? See, this activity will start after this activity ends. Activity A, B, and C. Activity B will start after activity A ends. You will see, can I start two days early? Can I start three days early? Right? What you are doing is, you are fast tracking it. This track is longer. And this track is shorter. Which means you are fast tracking it. You are saying A and B will be done in parallel. This is called fast tracking. Have you compressed the schedule? Yes. This is the length, length of your schedule. Has it compressed to shorter length? Yes, absolutely. Right? So what should have taken 5 plus 7, 12, let's say for example, and 3, 15 days will now be done in 5 days here. It will still take 7 days, but you are starting 3 days early, which means 5 plus 4 plus 3. You are able to do it in 12 days only instead of 15. So what you are trying to do here is trying to do two activities in parallel. Let us say, for example, you are constructing a building and you are running out of time. Right? You are painting the wall and at the same time, you have to work on ceiling as well. Right? So your plan is that we will first finish the painting and then we will finish the uh, ceiling. But now that you are running out of time, you said, okay, ceiling guys, can you come three days early? Can we do two things in parallel? Okay, that is called fast tracking. What happens with fast tracking? The ceiling guy will come two days early. They might obstruct the painting work. Some painting might get damaged. So with fast tracking, you will be able to reduce the time, but you will add little bit of risk. See, little bit of paint damage is fine. You are able to save three days. Right? So that is called fast tracking. Fast tracking will add a little bit of risk. The second technique of schedule compression is that if you are not able to fast track, okay, let us say, for example, I'm working on floor and then I have to work on wall. I cannot do both the things in parallel. I have to put the concrete, I have to wait for a day, let the concrete become strong, and then only I can work on wall. Okay, so there is no way I can do both the things in parallel. There's a technical dependency. There's a mandatory dependency. I cannot do those things in parallel. So what will you do? You will put in some more resources. You will say, okay, uh, now two people are pouring the concrete. Let us have four people pouring the concrete. So can we can finish it faster. Right? That idea is called crashing. Crashing means adding more resources to complete an activity faster. Fast tracking is doing things in parallel. Crashing is adding resources to do the same activity faster. Yes, Kate, please, please go ahead. You are a doubt, right? Hi, Hamid. Ah, yes, please. Uh, this is Kalai. Yeah. So uh, first, I uh, will go on the fast tracking. So while doing the fast tracking, the quality of the project work should be uh, less, right? It means uh, it might we have more yes. right, so, quality. So what happens is when you are doing two things in parallel. The yeah. quality will get impacted, the risk will also, uh, risk will happen, risk. Which it, will, it might yeah. reduce the quality, correct. Okay, and going if going for the crashing, right, that then if you're adding the resources, then cost also will be cost will increase. added, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yes, Malvika, go ahead. Uh, Amit, is uh, resource smoothing and crashing the same? Uh, or if not, what's the difference? Yes. Now you tell me what's the difference. The objective is different. Right? Here your objective is to finish on time by adding some resources, but leveling the resource and right? using the same number of resources throughout the project. So your objective is to optimize the resource. Your objective is to use the same number of resources throughout the project and yet complete on time. 
compression your objective is to reduce the time reduce the schedule by adding resources so that they can do activities faster right so here if your project's target is 31st march you are adding resources to complete the project on 31st march itself but here your schedule says that you will finish the project in 31st march your management said no finish it in 15th march only so your objective is to compress the schedule finish the project faster hence you are adding resources right? so that's the difference here you are still trying to finish on time but use the same number of resources here you are adding resources so that you can do activities faster understood yeah. any other question anyone Uh, yes, Amit. So, okay. in terms of cost, resource smoothing won't, uh, you know, involve any other cost. It will be within that budget, but the crashing would involve some other extra cost, right? See, resource so, smoothing could also be involve adding cost. resources because you are adding resources. Okay, so it might still add some cost, but not as much as crashing, because in crashing you are doing things faster to bring it back to uh, to reduce the schedule. But here your manpowers will be distributed. So your uh, manpower cost will not increase that much, but there could be a few things that could that could increase. Yeah, any change, any change uh, you make. For example, best case scenario. Yeah. Best case scenario, obviously, resource smoothing is much more uh, required, but case to case basis. If, yes, uh, it's absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Timeline is uh, we have to decrease the timeline, then crashing is correct. Correct. So if you have made a mistake and you have to decrease the timeline, use crashing. If your management is asking you to reduce the schedule, use crashing. But if you see that uh, many activities are distributed uh, waywardly in, in the project and you may need more resources at, at a given point of time, less resources at other point of time, use smoothing. Objective will decide which technique you are going to use. All right, shall you move ahead? Okay. Now type of contracts. Another very important part, frequently confused. Okay. Contract is what you give as a legal document to your supplier. Right? You are contracting them for a certain point part of work in your project. Let us say you are building your own house. Okay. You are managing the construction of it, structure of it, you are discussing with all the vendors and everything. But for interiors of your house, you are giving it to somebody else. Right? So you are saying that, okay, my project is to build the house. Just a second. So your project is to build the house. This is your project. I just request everyone, please uh, mute yourself. If there is no question, that is. Okay. So the project is to build the house. Okay. What you are contracting a supplier for is interior of the house. Right. You have found a nice interior designer, and you are trying to. Uh, provide that contract to that particular. This is what you are trying to put a contract. Right? What are the ways in which you can have the contract? Okay, and listen to this very carefully because uh, this is where I talk about scenarios in the PMP exam. Right? So the project is to build the house. Supplier, you are contracting for interior work. Now what can you do? Let us say you are a software engineer. You might not be an expert in interior work. What will you do? You will try to find a good reputed interior designer who could take all the responsibilities with them. Okay. And give the interior finished with you. They will prepare the design. They'll check with you. They'll show everything. They'll talk to carpenters. They'll talk to anybody. Okay. But they would take care of the entire interior themselves. Why would you do that? Because you yourself are not an expert. So what will you do? You will talk to that interior designer 
and you will tell them that, look, this is what I'm going to do. I will give you, uh, let's say, for example, $1,000 and finish the work for me. So you will negotiate with that interior designer and you will fix the contract. Right? You are the buyer, interior designer is the supplier. You have fixed the contract with that supplier saying $1,000 is what I want to give. Now, why would you do that? Because you are not an expert. So you thought if I fix an amount negotiating, then whatever goes wrong with the interior designer or whatever goes right with the interior designer, okay, let them handle it. I will not have a risk. Right? So when you're negotiating, you maybe you may be charged extra or less. That depends on your negotiation power. But after you have fixed the contract, you will not have any risk, which means buyer will not have any risk or less risk, let us say. Financial risk, right? Anything goes wrong in interior designing, they cannot ask you extra charge because you have fixed the contract. If you have done it legally, they cannot ask. Right? So they cannot ask you anything extra. If they save something, they will also not ask you to reduce the cost. Right? So you will always be paying the same amount. Whatever the risk is there, positive or negative, risk or reward, is both with supplier. Right? That is one case scenario. Now let us say that you are a person who is an expert in interior. Or you have somebody in your relation who knows a lot of interior vendors who knows carpenters, who knows lighting, who's, who has probably worked with interior designers, somebody you know, right? Or you yourself are an expert in interior design, or at least know what interior designing is, or you have connections. What will you do? You will say, instead of giving somebody $1,000, why can't I myself carry out these interior activities? I will hire the carpenter, I will hire the electrician, I will hire the uh, showcase or showpieces person, I will get my uh, showpieces done myself because I have the contacts, I have the expertise, I already know these things, or at least a person who is next to me knows this. So what will you say? You will have different type of contractors and you will tell them, tell me whatever your cost is, I will work with you, and I'll give you some margin over it. So what will you do? You will have some installers, right? Who would be working on your in your house? You will connect these installers with different vendors, carpenters, electricians, okay, AC person, lighting person, whoever is that. You will connect with them with this person, help them, okay? Why would you help? Because you know these carpenters, electricians, and other people. Right? They, whatever they are charging, these installers will give you the same bill with bill to you or invoice to you. Right? Whatever the carpenters, electricians, AC person are charging these installers, they will give the invoice to you. Plus, you will have to pay some margin, some profit to your installer also. Otherwise, why would the installer work? Right? So in this case, installer is your supplier. You have connected them with other contractors to whom, with whom they will purchase the material. Because you are an expert, you have connections, you will talk to carpenters, you will talk to electricians and try to reduce the cost. So you think that this arrangement is better for you in the project. Right? Installer thinks that, okay, whatever is happening, Okay, if the cost increases, I will put that bill plus my margin. If the cost decreases, I will put that bill and plus my margin. So what happens is the risk after the amount is fixed is all with the buyer. And what is this contract type called? Cost plus margin. Right? So this is called cost reimbursable. What you are saying is that I will reimburse all your cost to the installer with carpenter, electrician, AC, or whatever it is. Plus, I'll also give you some margin so that you can also earn a little bit. But let us have this part of contract. 
Now, what happens with cost reimbursable? If carpenters charges more, they will charge you more. If the carpenter charges less, they will charge you less. So all the risk is with the buyer. Seller has no risk. Because seller will always get their margin. This bill is anyways, they are paying it to the supplier. Right? So they'll always get their margin. That is the idea of cost reimbursement. Right? This is what you do when the scope is clear, what you are going to do. If the scope itself is not clear, right? how much uh, of interior designing that you want, you, you, you are not sure with that. Okay, or let us think about any other example where you are not sure what the scope is. So what will you do? You will say, okay, give me five installers. Okay, and I'll keep letting you know what all things that I want. And you give me at that particular rate. Fix the rate of installer at, let's say, for example, $100 per day. At $100 per day, I will fix the rate of all these installers. And whether I want it for one month, two months, three months, four months, five months, I would still pay you according to how many days they have worked. If they have worked for one month, I'll pay for 30 days. If they have worked for three, three months, I'll pay for 90 days. That is called time and material contract, where your scope is not clear. You don't know how much of wood would be required. You don't know how much wires will be required. So you fix a rate for everything. I'll purchase wood at $10 per kg. I'll purchase wires at $1 per meter. You fix a rate for everything. You fix a rate for time of your installers. You fix a rate of materials. Because you're not clear, what all things do you need in that? But you say that, okay, you start, I'll keep on informing you. If it takes more time, then I'll pay more. If it takes less time, I'll pay you less. What happens with that? The cost is not fixed. If it changes, you will have to pay more. The supplier will have to work more. If it reduces, you will have to pay less. Supplier will have to work less. So the risk is balanced between your supplier and you, between the buyer and seller. It is exactly what happens in project also. When you fix the contract, buyer would say you, I will always pay the same amount. So whatever mistake the supplier makes, the risk is theirs. Whatever benefit that they can have by reducing the cost, it is there. So risk and reward both is with seller, buyer does not have any risk. If it is cost reimbursable, you will always pay them the cost. So if the cost increases, you will have to pay more. If the cost decreases, you will have to pay less. Okay? So the risk is nothing with supply. All the risks are yours. In time and material, the risk is balanced. Is this clear, everyone? Fixed price, you fix the price that you have to pay to the supplier. Cost reimbursable, you will ask them for their invoices, their cost, and plus you will give some margin. Time and material, you will fix a rate at which you will be paying. You don't know the scope, so you will say that if you work for 15 days, I'll pay for 15 days. If you work for 30 days, I'll pay for 30 days. Right? And the risk for fixed price, buyer has less risk because you have fixed the price. Whatever changes, seller will have to handle it. For cost reimbursable, buyer has high risk. Seller does not have any risk because you there, they will always get their cost. Whether it is more or less, seller will always get their cost. Time and material it is fixed. It is balanced. Both have equal risk. Right? Now the question is what about incentives and awards? Right? Many of you would have seen fixed price incentive type of contract. Okay. Or cost reimbursable, cost plus incentive cost plus award, these type of contracts. The question is, what is the difference between incentive and awards and why do we need that? Okay, see, you would want your suppliers to do a little bit extra work for you, little bit better in terms of quality, little bit faster. Okay, so you want to incentivize them. You want to compensate them for the good job that they are doing. And you want to motivate them for doing good job. 
That is why you would add incentive and awards to your cost reimbursable and fixed price. The time and material is anyways rate. So they do more, they get more. They do less, they get less. So you don't have to add incentives to that. You can do that, okay, if you want, but you generally don't, don't do that. But for fixed price and cost reimbursable, you will do that. What do we mean by that? Incentives is objective, which means incentives you fix their performance and the rate. You will say that if you deliver two weeks early, I'll pay you 10% extra. If you deliver in such and such quality, I'll, I'll give you 5% extra. Right? So your incentive is already fixed and it is objective, which means you can also measure it. Awards are subjective, which means what you are going to give to the supplier will be decided at the end because it is not very easy to calculate. What was their support in the project success? is a little bit difficult to calculate. Let us say, for example, you are doing an agile project for software development. You had hired few of the developers from a contractor. They are also working, your team is also working and they're all working collectively. You don't know exactly who has done what and how much were their effort in terms of making the project successful. So at the end of the project, you would try to have a subjective analysis, discussion with the team members. Subjective means without any numbers. Okay, feelings, expectations, behaviors, and all those things. You will observe that and you will try to provide them some award. This award is not declared in the beginning itself. In incentive, you have already declared it. That only if you deliver two weeks early, then I will pay you 10% extra. Otherwise, I will pay you the same amount. Right? That is your incentive and award. Cost plus incentive, cost plus award, fixed plus incentive, fixed plus award, everything same. Right? Sometimes they might also, which will not be asked in the exam, but they might also consider the economic variation. Right? Fixed price plus economic variation, which means, see, if you're doing an international project, the dollar value to rupees value, rupees value to euro value, this will all fluctuate, right? So in order to take care of that fluctuation, you are saying that, okay, I'll give you a fixed price, but this is valid only for fluctuation of 2%. If it fluctuates more than 2%, then we will add those economic variation also to the cost. So these are the ways in which you will see different contracts. Is it clear, everyone? Any questions? Three types of contract, fixed price, Cost reimbursable and time and material. Fix, the supplier has fixed the price. So uh, the buyer has fixed the price. So they don't have to pay anything extra if something goes wrong. So the risk is with supplier. Cost reimbursable, anything goes wrong, the cost will also go high. So you will have to pay more. So the risk is with you. Time and material, the risk is balanced. Right? Now, just the last two topics. Conflict management techniques. Okay, so whenever you are trying to manage conflicts, okay, there are two things in part. You are having a conflict with somebody else. So what you do is you put your concern for yourself and concern for others on a chart. If your concern for yourself is high, you will be in this range. If your concern for yourself is low, you will be in this range. If your concern for others is low, you will be in this range. Concern for others is high, you will be in this range. So you will have four different quadrants whenever you are talking about conflict management techniques. And there will be something in between. Right? These are the five conflict management techniques. Depending on how much concern do you have for whom. If you have high concern for yourself and high concern for others, you will fall in this quadrant. This will be your quality conflict management technique. If you have low concern for both, this is where you will fall. Okay. So what happens is you get these four quadrants plus fifth at center. If you have high concern for your opinion, if you have high concern for others' opinion in the conflict, you fall in quadrant one, which is called collaborate which means the conflict is between you and somebody else, 
you both have and you have high concern for your opinion also and their opinion also so you are trying to collaborate and solve the problem right this is your best conflict resolution technique because both the parties will be happy from it both have a win win situation now if your concern for yourself is low okay your own opinion you have less concern okay let us go with the other person's opinion that is high but your opinion is low right low area your opinion is low concern for others is high so you are falling in this quadrant so you are saying okay fine let it let it go with somebody else's opinion your concern for others opinion is more okay i should not get into this conflict okay let us take take their point and let us go ahead let let the project not get affected right so for your project objective you are saying that okay let us go with somebody else's opinion which is called smoothing things so you have smoothed the conflict you have accommodated to their point of view right so they have you have lost but they have won right in our project management for anything contract discussion negotiation agreements whatever we do we should always seek win win both the parties should be happy right here you are not happy the other person is happy which means it is not a good conflict resolution technique you are somewhere not happy okay so this conflict might arise again now when you have low concern for yourself and you have low concern for others opinion also what does this mean that you think that your opinion is also not that good others opinion is also not that good so let us withdraw from the conflict let us avoid it let us take it some time out let us take a pause and then we'll fight again which means you will gather some more information so that your concern for your opinion will go high concern for others opinion will go high both of you will gather some more information and then you will try to collaborate right so withdraw is a conflict management technique where both of you take out from the conflict and you say no we will not fight with the this one that is called avoid if your concern for yourself is high but for others is low you are falling in this quadrant which means you will force your opinion on to them that is why it is called force and in the middle you have little bit concern for yourself little bit concern for others which means it is a compromise neither of you have won neither of you have lost it is a midway middle ground that you have found that is called conflict management resolution techniques collaboration is the best whenever you see a problem try to collaborate and solve it if the collaboration has not worked then go for compromise if you see that the person is unnecessary uh, unnecessarily having a conflict and it is impacting your project's uh, objective go for force it if you see that there is a conflict but there is not much difference between both of your opinions go for smoothing if you don't have information you are not able to resolve try to avoid okay. these are your conflict management techniques then the last part the change control very very important part in traditional approach whenever there is a change it could either be from customer or it could be from the team you would always raise the change request right whenever change request is raised the team would analyze it after the analysis team will conduct the impact analysis of the change that if this change happens will it impact my cost schedule resource what is it going to impact that report will be created and the project manager will check that report then the project manager will discuss with the change control board about the change and the change control board will review the report submitted approving authority or change control board they will review the report submitted and they would either approve it or reject it if it is rejected inform the customer that it is rejected for xyz reason if it is approved then the team will first change the plan then they will implement those changes and the change will be delivered to the customer right so for any change first you should have a change request if you have already planned if you are within the planning phase and then somebody asks for change you don't need change request but once you have planned you have taken a sign off any change happens of any nature 
raise a change request, conduct the analysis, do the analysis, understand what it will impact, talk to the change control board, let the change control board approve, change the plan, implement the change and deliver it to the customer. Right? This is why it is called integrated change control because you are doing impact analysis. You are looking at many different aspects and area of the project. Integration, scope, quality, everything. Integration includes all these parts. Hence, it is called integrated change control. Why is it called control? Because it is being controlled by somebody. Right? This is your change, change management approach for any project. Very, very, very important. Always try to understand the change, understand the mistake, understand the problem. Always try to do that. Then analyze that change. See what kind of impact will be there. Only then take decision. And once the decision is taken, first change the plan. Then implement that change. That's the idea of change management. Okay. This is only for predictive environment. Absolutely. In agile environment, product owner will do all these activities. Product owner will carry out the analysis. Product owner will uh, check the impact, try to understand the impact, and then they will incorporate. Okay, that is uh, agile, traditional. This is how complicated it is. Right. So these were the topics that I wanted to discuss with respect to PMP essentials. Okay. Any questions? Anyone from whatever we have discussed? Has it been helpful? Yes. Sir. Yes, Amit. A lot. Yes, yes Amit. Thanks a lot. Definitely. Not for that. So, uh, in term, uh, like uh, for those who are taking the exam in one week or two weeks or three weeks. Okay. Uh, I'll be uploading this on YouTube. I'll share the link with all of you and it will be uploaded on the drive also. So please go through this maybe one or two times again, if you have confusion with any of these topics. Okay. It will be helpful for your uh, quick revision. So along with the mindset that will help you in people domain, uh, this video will help you in process domain as well. Right. So this would cover, uh, I would say the essentials of it. Mindset plus this essential part would help you in last minute revision, maybe two days, three days for your exam. So use this video. Part. If you have any, any, uh, any doubt, okay, then let me know and we can discuss any of these topics separately also. Okay. Hamid, uh, so the first two weeks, yeah, you have started with the, the topic wise, right? The 1.1, 3 1, 2.1, like that. So suddenly you uh, changed this, this model. This is the this is this is, this is yeah. the part of planning only. Okay, so we are okay, still, okay. still with that flow. So in planning, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things. So I thought instead okay. of going through that uh, those tasks, okay, yes, yes, much tasks, better to yeah. discuss those points which will be asked in the exam. Right? So we're still with okay, okay. we're still with the planning, and then next week when we, when we meet, we'll be talking about execution and other part as well. Okay, okay, yeah. Thanks, so much. Clarification. Okay. All right. Okay, so if uh, is there any question, anyone else? If there are no questions, then uh, let us connect on Monday for question and answer. Yes, somebody is saying something. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, no session tomorrow, right, Amit? Uh, no, nothing tomorrow. We'll be meeting on Monday. Okay. Okay. This Thank you, Amit. All right, Thank Amit. Uh, yeah, please, Amit. Uh, are you uh, so this week? Uh, do you upload any questions for this chapters or the process? Yes, yes. I'll, I'll be uploading the questions. Okay. So, uh, probably nice. tomorrow you will see some questions. I'll upload. I'll update it on the drive also. I mean, on the group also that I've uploaded. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amit. All right. Thank you. Yeah, Amit. Oh, uh, for yes. mock test, uh, I've been the mock test three. Uh, after that, is there any other mock test that I can go for? Yeah, you should go for mock test four. Okay, I'll share the link with you. So four. you can go, go with okay. mock test four. Okay, three, four, five, and then one and okay, two thanks, uh, is something that you will take. You should take later. Okay. okay, understood. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Any other question? Anyone? Okay. If not, then have a good night for all those who are in India and uh, a great day for all those outside uh, India. Right. I'll see you on Monday with question and answer. Good night, Amit. Good night, all. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Amit. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks.